everybody. I'm so excited. Jenny Marcello. I mean, isn't there any? Is there anything better than this? We got Jen. A lot of things on the podcast. We got you on the podcast. Now, uh, I've been, I've been so excited about having you on this podcast because one, I'll get to it later. You blew my mind. You've blown my mind many, many times over the last last month and a half. Uh, you changed the way I think about movement. You thought you changed the way I think about my athletes. Uh, I feel like I have to go back to school and re-educate myself because apparently I didn't learn anything in the 25 years that I've been coaching, the, the five years that I spent in college. And uh, I just wanted to go through with with you, have this conversation so that my audience could listen in on the, uh, the absolute knowledge bombs that are uh, coming their way. So uh, Jen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for the invite. This is amazing. Now, I don't like long intros. I'm like, if people want to look yeah. you up, they can look you up and figure out what you are. But just briefly, give us sure. a, like, like a, a, synaps a synapsis or a synopsis of what you are, what you do, and then we'll get right into the nitty gritty. For sure. Yeah, I probably operate more so uh, in the rehab space, but certainly carry over to the performance side as well. Um, Really, my niche, I would say, is baseball. I work with a lot of pitchers at this point, um, certainly some position players as well. But as you know, starting to kind of drift into some other areas such as golf and and swimming and whatnot. Um, but I love the rotational sports and and I like to look at things through a little different lens, I would say, and that I think comes from a couple different backgrounds of certainly having a strength and conditioning background out of college, but going to chiropractic school and understanding, you know, how the whole system kind of gets put together, um, obviously from a medical standpoint as well. Um, and then just from, you know, performance overall, you know, taking everything in together. So full into the spectrum from soup to nuts um, and mostly sports. Actually, all I thought you were going to say is that you're a mom. <laughs> and I mean, that too. <laughs> it's also the most important job you could possibly do. I would agree with that. And probably the hardest job. That probably takes the cake. Yeah, well, the hardest job would be keeping your husband in line because we've had <laughs> we've had Brendan Marcello on the uh on the podcast many times. And uh I can't believe I always said to him, I'm like, uh, maybe I should have your wife on. He goes, eh, eh, maybe not. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I think she'd be great. And he's like, Well, she's not really a great conversationalist. I'm like, what? Why would you say that, Brandon? He's like, well, she's no George Michael. And I'm like, why? What's with the George Michael? Always the George Michael. This I know. Guy. I'm always compared to George Michael. It's my, like, his favorite singer. By, <laughs> by the way, my wife and I watched the Wham! documentary on Netflix. We won't go there. That's off topic. But man, oh man, now my wife is just playing Wham! throughout the house. Like, every day, all I hear is Wham! I'm like, I thought, <laughs> there's something there. There's something there. I'm sure Wham! goes through your house as well. Uh, so, yes. Let's go into it. You're, you're working in baseball, um, but uh, like, how do you even like get to that path of, you know, because a lot of the audience are coaches and uh, a lot of them go like, oh, I want to work in the bigs. I want to I want to work in the PGA Tour. Or I want to work with great athletes. Mm -hmm. And I, whenever I talk to coaches about that, that kind of journey to get there, it's kind of like. Like, did you have that as a dream? Was that one of your dream bigs? Like, oh, my God, I really want to work in baseball. Or did the path just kind of meander you there by just being in the trenches and working hard and all of a sudden opportunities led you towards that path? How'd you get into baseball? <clears throat> Definitely didn't, didn't, <laughs> growing up, I thought baseball was very boring, actually. <laughs> I grew up a huge football fan. My dad was a huge Miami Dolphin, Miami Hurricane fan. So we t watched tons of football. And I do remember watching the athletic trainers run out in the field and be like, that would be really cool. Like, I'd love to be able to do something like that. Uh, and so obviously like took the medical path, but my internship was actually first ones at University of Miami working on 300 pound linemen at five foot three, 115 pounds, just knew I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> That's just not going to match. Uh, so it was, a, it was a quick, you know, return to reality. Um, but then what was great was I worked at UCSD um, 
smaller school in San Diego, obviously, but had every sport but football, better choice, uh, and grew an affinity towards golf, and they had swimming and tennis and, and baseball. So that was a really nice kind of entry into a lot of different sports to be able to say, which ones do I kind of gravitate toward? And I really gravitated towards the rotational sports at that time. Um, as you know, I probably worked with Todd Durkin uh, at his place for six, seven years, and we had a, a lot of, um, yes, a lot of quarterbacks coming through there, but we also had a lot of baseball. But you got to get your mind right, Jen. You got to get your mind right. You know, you're not going to make it in this world unless you have impact. You got to make an impact in the world, Jen. That might be one of the best impressions I've seen. Um, Give me two claps. Okay, I won't. Yeah, there I'm you done. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it was it was through that that I kind of got pushed into baseball um, and and just had to learn, obviously, a lot about the sport because I didn't know much about it from growing up. It wasn't a sport that I played or watched, whatever, um, but really enjoyed learning something new and the mechanics behind the, that um, took on more baseball players and then soon kind of was uploaded into the Padres organization uh, and then made my way over to the Twins, so. It wasn't wow. something I, I was searching for, but I knew I liked being in the sports realm and potentially with a team at some point. So is that what put you in Florida again? Like the whole uh, being in that kind of baseball spring camp, um, the minors are there, like everything. Because uh, you were on the West Coast, were you not? And then back to Florida, like after yeah. San Diego? I wish that was the scenario, but the scenario was San Diego was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and at that point we had one I had one kiddo um, that was almost two we wanted to have another and we we're like man it would be so nice to have family close by to help so they happened to be in Sarasota so we made the move this way and just happened to be in a place where there's tons of baseball which is great so it worked itself out wow okay so your your home base is there and then you don't have to it's kind of like a satellite uh, taking care of athletes as opposed to going to Minnesota, let's say, or, or, uh, do you still have to travel to, to see the players a lot or are they you kind of a hub that they come to? Yeah. So a little bit of both. Um, I was, I was actually commuting down to Fort Myers. That's where the spring training site was for the twins. So I was with them for a number of years, um, and then went out in the private sector. And so with that, as you know, comes traveling to players, wherever they might be, Thankfully, a lot of those players happen to be on the twins. So if I, you know, go to them, I'm obviously able to tap into eight of them or so, right? So right. that makes life easier when you have all the players on one team, which I'm sure at some point that's going to diversify. Um, but then it, it, certainly in the off season, they come down my way since they're already coming towards the twins for other things. So it it works out that, you know, I go too, but they also come back in, in my direction. The reason why I bring that up is that I have, a, you know, my, my book, I'm not bragging or anything, but... Um... <laughs> Uh, no, not uh, but in my book, Dream Big, Over Deliver, Be Undeniable, uh, and uh, in my mentorship as well, I have a lot of coaches who come in and they say, I want this world, right? Uh -huh. And the reason why I, I kind of go down that path is I want people to understand, like, there's many different ways of working with athletes. And you can make it very specific. You could be in the team environment where you're actually like working in the team, uh, you know, where you're showing up at uh, 6 a.m. and you're leaving there at 8 p.m. And, and you're going to all the games and practices and all that kind of stuff. You can have that life, but you can also have a different life. Uh, and, and that life could be as a private, uh, you know, practitioner. Um, yep. All those things are possible, but, uh, you know, you, you got to really understand what you want out of it. And, and I think that that's, that's a good, you've kind of had a, a little bit of like working in a, in a club setting with Todd, working with an organization like the Padres and then the twins and now separating yourself and deciding that you want to have a little bit more uh, home life stability and still be able to do what you love. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, the, the team setting is fun for sure. Um, but as you said, having a family is super challenging, at least in baseball, it was for me. Uh, and, and being able to make your own hours, you know, say when you're available, uh, it's a little bit easier to be able to manage that. Um, but I, I appreciated my time there because you now you know how it, it is to be inside that team and you know what the yeah. athlete is experiencing um, through the rehab process or through their training. So experience on both sides is, is very um, beneficial. Well, I also have a lot of um, um, coaches who come into my mentorship and they go, oh, I just want to do what you do, right? And I'm like, but you're 25. Yes. Like, there, there is a gap between, you know, those 25 years. You, you, yeah. There is going to be a time when you have to be in the trenches. There's going to be a time when you're working those 60-hour work weeks. 
Uh, and those are the those are the building blocks, the foundation that builds the life that you can now pick and choose your clients, and you can now have the opportunity to to uh, work in in whatever arena you want. But uh, you wouldn't have those clients that you currently have in your private sector if you didn't work in the organization at some point and make those connections. So, um, yeah, well, not only connections, but make the mistakes, right? <laughs> on someone like, else's dollar. Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't want to be making a huge mistake on a major league guy that's being paid $30 million a year, right? Like, I'd rather learn through the minor league system and make some mistakes there along with, you know, very experienced people around me to be able to shape me uh, to get to where I am now, because you can't make huge mistakes at this level. <laughs> Just no, 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 you can't. No, you can't. And that, that's why I've always said in the past that, you know, uh, before I do anything, and, and we've done this with our correctives, which we're going to get to in a minute. Right. Yeah. Uh, I always try them on my first myself first. So if you mess yourself up, ah, you know, there's six to eight months of recovery. It's not a big deal. Uh, and <laughs> then I try it on my juniors because if you, you know, break a junior, yeah. there's always another one. Um, and then if that, if that works and they recover faster, and then if that works, then you bring it to your professionals. Right. right. So I have, I have some, some pros and they're like, I see some crazy stuff on Instagram. Yeah. we're not doing those exercises. We're supposed to be the best in the world and we're not doing the exercises that your juniors are doing. I'm like, yeah, yeah you don't want to go near that one. Yeah. We, we ruined three kids with that. No, I'm joking. Hey, if you're a junior out there listening to this, that's not true. That's not true. Um, so I want to go into, uh, I feel like I'm in Miami. So I want to go into what we're talking about over here. <laughs> Uh, I saw your presentation over there at the Perform Better Long Beach. By the way, too sunny, huh? <laughs> too sunny. Uh, but I saw your presentation there, and uh, I feel like we've we've known each other for years, but I've never actually been able to see you in the professional setting in that in that manner. Um, so I sat in on the lecture, and then I sat in on the on the hands on, and you blew my mind. You were uh, you were talking about um, kind of posture, uh, postural assessments that led to uh, performance. And but you talked about it through a different lens and in a different way that I've ever heard before. And it really like lit up my, uh, my mind because while you're talking about all these pictures and these different people, you bring up an image of an athlete and say, well, this particular athlete has X, Y, and Z. And I was like, Oh yeah, I never, I couldn't see that when I first looked, but now I can kind of see what you're talking about. And then you would show us how it transformed into a performance uh, gain. And the whole time I'm like, oh yeah, I have a client that has that. Oh, I'm, oh my God, I've, yeah, that's that's so-and-so. That's my client that does this. And I was like, oh my right. God, how did I not notice this before? And now I got to fix this. Jen, I need your help. So <laughs> since then, just fast forwarding since then, you've helped me with the numerous clients uh, I've, I've sent you their images, you've sent the back and we've had incredible light bulb moments, which we'll get to in a minute, but maybe just give us an idea of the, the lecture that you did and why when Performator says, what do you want to talk about, Jen? You're like, oh, I've got this. This is exactly what the topic I want. There's obviously something that that's like you said, you're really excited about it and this gets you jazzed up. So what is it? that that uh that got you uh you know what what is it that you wanted to share at perform better yeah so i i go back and i look at you know what's really changed my thinking or my thought process over the last couple of years that that maybe we've kind of accepted within the industry as oh this is the way it is um and for me one of those things was how we view ranges of motion right um, and how our position or our, our archetype, or meaning like structure, will influence those things um, rather than accepting, well, you know, the average is 60 ER and, and 40 IR, and that's kind of what we have. Understanding if I have an offensive lineman in front of me who's got this wide structure, how typically those structures are going to be more towards this wider archetype, which means that we have essentially a, a pelvis that has more uh, nutation in the sacrum, which gives more internal rotation of the femurs. And as a result, their system will be biased towards more internal rotation. Let's say like a 60 internal rotation, 40 external rotation versus on the under, other end of the spectrum. And you probably have many golfers that are like this. I think of like a Tiger Woods. Um, I think of like a Chris Sale when it comes to pitching. There's this long, lanky, um, kind of tall, cylindrical, narrow would be the, the archetype. 
and how those structures are actually biased towards more external rotation. And so clearly the, the expectation for their measurements are gonna be more towards the ER side. And so when we look at those two things, um, that can certainly dictate how we write programs, that can certainly dictate how this person moves and what they're gonna have available to them. Um, and as you know, not layering the same mechanics one person has, it looks amazing on somebody else. Um, so it really dictates quite a bit when, it, when we look at the entire um, spectrum of performance. Uh, and then also looking at um, posture, right? The, the position somebody is in and how that can certainly increase in, in internal rotation or, or increase in external rotation rather than maybe blaming something on a quote unquote tight hip is the position that they're standing in influencing that range of motion. And then that can certainly dictate, well, rather than going after a quote unquote mobility drill, if I do this sort of exercise that maybe shifts the position, now we bias them into this space and now we improve the hip ER or the hip IR, or whatever it is that we're trying to improve. So it certainly excuse me, changes the way you look um, at the performance spectrum with regard to these shapes, these positions, these archetypes. Okay, so that that's a really good synopsis of like your entire presentation, really concise, which is great. But for a lot of our listeners, they're going, what the hell is like an that archetype? What the hell is internal external rotation? Some people in this audience don't even know what a sacrum is. Sure. No, but, but uh, um, I think the, the thing that really um, kind of brought it together in a, in a like, I always say, if you can teach to a five year old, uh, yeah then we know we've, we've got it, right? And I think when you make the example of, uh, you know, the sprinters, Ben Johnson versus Carl Lewis, if you don't know yeah. who these people are, look it up, okay? <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. But you were telling the story about how much you love the Olympics and to see Ben Johnson, the Canadian, this powerhouse, he was just like this, he was, it almost looked like he was on steroids. I mean, he was like big, like it looked like he had done some anabolic steroids anyways, but he didn't, but he, he looked like he was big. He had big muscles, big shoulders, big arms, big legs. Like he was just this massive man. And then you got little Carl Lewis. I haven't done a thing. I haven't, I haven't done any anabolic steroids, even though my forehead is four inches longer now than it was in college. I didn't do any growth hormone at all, but he, look different you know his teeth he, he could eat an apple through a through a tennis racket i'm just saying i'm just saying he looked different he looked different he was tall slender long yeah now yeah both of these people have the same job the job is yeah. to be a race car down a hundred meter dash as fast as you possibly can now yeah. in that role both have different as you said architects archetypes types archetypes Type. yeah types types architect yeah. so they have a different <laughs> shape to their body and yeah. that shape is going to give them certain physical characteristics that the other shape will not provide but that other shape will provide other things that the other one won't so now you put them both in the same arena and you go let's go let's have a race uh yeah. maybe let's break down just so people understand like i think that that shows such a uh um, yeah. dichotomy that yeah. I understand that there's there's different ways of, of creating performance. For sure. Yeah. So first I have to give huge credit and and this goes to Bill, uh, Bill Hartman, who was really the one many people have looked at archetypes, whether it's Shirley Sarman, whether it's um, Ida Rolf, right? We've identified these different shapes, structure, if you want to call it, <clears throat> um, in the past. But I think what's so important is Bill's been one to look at it and say, yes, we have these different shapes, but what does that mean with regard to how we produce force, right? Or what those ranges of motion are. So, so huge credit to him for this. Uh, but a, a great example, as you, as you brought up, were the two sprinters. <clears throat> so as you can picture, as you said, Ben Johnson's got this kind of wider structure to him. He's got kind of more muscle bulk to him. Um, but what that physical shape of the pelvis does is we talked about the, the sacrum, which is this triangle bone within the pelvis. And as that sacrum kind of pushes forward, that's called sacral nutation. He is biased toward that structure, right? And when you have a sacrum that tilts forward and you have a pelvis, therefore, that's biased towards more internal rotation, he has an easier time with force production. And so, so what is that? A, yeah. That kind of has that tilted pelvis forward, looks like his butt sticking out. Uh, sometimes you'll see those sprinters. It almost looks like they have a little bit of a gut almost because 
the abs are protruding forward and the butt protruded back behind you. Basically, they look like a really fast Kardashian. Yeah, exactly. They must be. <laughs> they picked the wrong sport. <laughs> um, but yes. So if, if you just think of what the sacrum is doing, so as a result of the sacrum tilting forward, their center of mass is actually lower to the ground. In addition to having a shape of a pelvis where the outlet has more has, has better ability to pressurize up. So what does that mean? That means that starting speed for him is going to be a lot easier, a lot better than someone like um, Carl Lewis, who's this more kind of skinny tube, right? And the skinnier tubes have a harder time pressurizing. But what they're great at is that top end speed, meaning velocity. So they have easier access towards the external rotation, which is going to be like the late push out of out of the you know running. So as they get out of um, the starting blocks, it's gonna be a little bit slower, but man, when they get upright, that velocity is what's gonna carry him. So he would usually finish the race really strong, but start really slow. And then Ben Johnson would be just the opposite, really great start, but wouldn't be able to finish as strong as, Car as Carl Lewis, so. Right, and then if you go to, let's say somebody like Usain Bolt, uh what kind of archetype would you put him in is, is is there is there a neutral is there somewhere between the two yeah. that you have the optimized uh because he always has like a little bit of a slower start in comparison to some and then mm -hmm. he just zoof, he's almost like more like carl lewis would you say i'd say he's probably yes biased towards more of that narrow archetype the other thing that's interesting is so you have archetype but you also have configuration so configuration would be for him, Usain Bolt, I've got a little wider thorax and then a smaller pelvis. Mm. And that in and of itself can certainly play into force or power, right? Being able to kind of push the guts down into the pelvic floor and then bouncing them back up and out. Um, uh, Michael Jordan would be another one with that, that would have that classification. So that kind of like V shape that we often see with athletes can be very advantageous when it comes to power. But yes, I would classify him more as a narrow um, than, than the others, so. so. That triangle of like big thorax, small pelvis, big power athletes, uh, Usain Bolt, Michael Jordan, Jason Duffner. Yep. Um, like that's, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking there at you go. Yeah, yes. three powerful athletes. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work now with, uh, with a couple of our players where mm -hmm. this is the part that, that really is going to blow, uh, I think the audience away. Um, I literally sent you face on, uh, back on, if that's a term side view, right side view left of them, just like naturally just standing, um, with, you know, uh, basically nothing on, but like, you know, a little something to cover up the, uh, the goods, but that, so you could see as much muscle as possible. You can yeah. see skin tone, you can see all that kind of stuff. And, and somehow, some way, just so everybody understands what's going on here, somehow, some way through just looking at those pictures, you were able to tell me one, the archetype, you were able to tell me kind of the orientation. You were able to tell me, oh, on the left side, we have a uh, tightness of the upper oblique, external oblique. This is going to cause this. And then we have on the bottom, we have a toe that does this. So that means that this is happening up further up the chain. And, and I, I'm like, how do you get all this from just a picture? And then at first I was a little bit, this is, this is kind of weird until <laughs> I went to Minnesota to the 3M, worked with these athletes on the correctives. And as soon as I went into, well, Jen said this, 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 and they're like, oh my God, that's exactly what I'm feeling. And I'm like, oh really? And then, uh, then they're like, oh yeah, when I do this and they move and I go, oh, see it, that's what she said would happen. And yes, and, but you nailed it off of some pictures. I don't get it. How is this possible? Is it like you've just been doing this so long that I can't look at somebody's picture and go, oh yeah, yeah, that person's gonna need a hair replacement. Now I can watch the Victoria's Secret model show and figure out, you know, who has wings and who doesn't. But you know. Well, yeah, you know, I think I it's funny because if you if you asked me back in chiropractic school, I would probably have poo-pooed any sort of um postural evaluation, right? Like, what is this really gonna do for me? Um, but again, like I think when we look at the shape of, of certain things. And we understand, I think, you know, one thing that really resonated with you was understanding the three phases of gait of early, middle, and late. 
And in those three phases, there's an ER bias, there's an IR bias through the middle zone, and then back into an ER bias into the late zone. So if you understand what those shapes are of here's what the thorax looks like in early, and here's what the pelvis looks like in early, and here's what a foot looks like in early, then you can appreciate the relationship of all of those things. And then when you look at somebody, you can say, you know what, this is a pelvis that's biased toward this position or that position. And then you start to look at, well, what compensatory strategies, if they can't change the shape to get internal rotation, they've got to create it some way, somehow. And here's a compensatory way that we typically see it. Okay. Do you see how the shoulder is rolled forward and down? That's right. creating his downforce, right? So it, it's, it's not as easy as like, oh, you just, you know, put it all together, but understanding each position and shape. And then if they cannot change that shape, what's going to be the compensation to get there? And then do I see some of those things showing up, whether it be what a muscle looks like with regard to tone, right? Or where the relationship of a foot is in relation to the hip sort of thing, um, where someone's center of mass is shifted, right? All of those things come into play when understanding where somebody is in space and then what compensations that they're using. And then you take that and you clearly link that to some sort of movement and say, if I see this here in a static position, I'm likely going to see this show up in a toe touch or this show up in a squat. And then, hey, when they go to do a swing, this is what's going to happen in the backswing because they do not have access to this position. And here's what the compensation is that we should see. And when all of those things link up, it's like home run. I know where to go. Okay. So let's, let's rewind just a bit because yeah. this is also um, something that is still on my mind. So I, I, I hate to use this podcast as an opportunity to, to learn for myself as well, but I uh, think you audience, selfish guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm so selfish. Um, so you talk about gates. Now, if you yeah. think about somebody walking, so mm -hmm. like contralateral, right arm forward, left leg forward, and then you go into this middle zone where there, there's a transition of those arms and legs moving, and then you're on the other side. So now if we just focused on my right side, if my right arm is forward, left foot is forward, that is early gait, late gait. So, so the foot that's going forward, if your left foot is forward, yeah. your left side is early. Left side is early. My right arm though is in late. Correct. Yes. So, so don't be don't be distracted by the extremities because I think they take the extremities off because people look at the obviously the contralateral movement mm. right and they get caught up in saying well this arm is or forward this. so they're doing opposite things people think that we're doing opposite things right when in reality the trunk and the pelvis are actually doing the same thing it's just one is delayed behind the other one. So if you take a snapshot, we see this delay of the trunk is still behind, the pelvis is starting to turn, and we see the extremities in an opposite position. So they must be, we must be twisting in the middle. Right. And that's not, it's, that's not how it actually works, right? So it's like, if you step forward with the left foot, that, that's actually going to be an early, okay? And as you step forward with that left foot, what happens is the left side slows down and the right side moves forward faster. Right. But what we don't appreciate is that it's this segmental wave that's happening from the ground up, which is why it looks like things move in opposition. Okay. So if we're going to use these terms early, middle, late, we're going yeah. to take the extremities off. That's very helpful, by the way. Um, okay. So if we just looked at at me going this right, left, right shoulder forward, that would show that I've now like finished my, my basically my step. Yes, yeah. correct. So then, what's happening on the back of that right side is that you're being pushed from behind, right? If that right shoulder is coming forward, everything on that right side is being pushed. Yes. Right, which is th that's you stepping off. And okay. now you're getting ready to step onto the left side. Right, okay. So my, my point to this is how does, is gait that entwined in everything mm -hmm. uh, because we do so much of it? throughout the day or is it just you guys found a great way of saying like let's this analogy matches or is it actually based on the fact that we're always locomoting and therefore this gate can dictate a lot of internal and external rotations of the of the actual extremities and in that 100 percent. i think people i think well, again this was so helpful for me was when you ask bill about gate he'll he'll call it propulsion 
You ask Bill, you know Bill Gates, you just go, well, oh, hello, hey, Bill Gates, how are you doing? <laughs> is, are Not you? Bill Gates, oh. Bill Hartman. Yeah. So, so Bill Hartman refers oh, okay. to uh, state in the way of propulsion, right? And if you think about what's rolling, well, it's propulsion. What's crawling, it's propulsion. Walking is propulsion, running, right? They're, these are all phases of propulsion. And what's really, I think, helpful, at least for me, was rather than thinking of all of these things as different entities, different ways of moving, they're all the same thing because we really can only create three shapes with regard to how the pelvis, the spine, the, the rib cage all articulate and move. There's those three shapes that we can make. So it doesn't matter if you're crawling or if you're if you're rolling. When you're rolling, one side's moving faster than the other. And guess what's happening? You get to an ER position, you get to a middle position where things are stacked. There's your IR position. And then you roll past, you're going back into an ER position. So if you can only physically make three shapes, then it stands to reason that how we propulse, whether it be through hitting um, a golf club, whether it be through pitching, whether it be through running, those three shapes, those three movements are going to transcend all of it. So it's less that you have to memorize because if I look, I think, you know, I don't have a lot of experience working with golfers, but what I do have experience with is understanding those three positions of movement and understanding which one somebody can't get into and out of. And if I can see that, then I can take it and say, here's what your guy can't do. Here's where we need to go back to the basics and achieve this early position or this middle position. And once we can get there, then we can translate that to the actual swing. So that that's brilliant. And that takes years of like, even when you're describing these things, we have these zoom calls about our players and then you, you know, take me through what you see. Um, even then I'm still going back and watching it. It's the second time I watch those zoom zoom calls and I'm making notes that I'm really getting like the gems out of it. Um, yeah. so at first, at first light for people that are listening to this right now, if you're like, Oh my God, like the same feeling I had, I have to go back to school because this is crazy. Okay. It's just, it's just different. Yeah, exactly. And it never ends. And that was the beautiful thing about it is you really got me excited about uh, learning this stuff. So, um, but to keep it really practical for people, because we're talking hypothetic, hypothetical, you're on the video podcast right now. Let's just use this as an example. My right shoulder in general, it it's always forward and rotated down and forward like this. And I'm constantly- by the wrinkles on your shirt. Yeah, and I'm constantly going like this, like I'm constantly trying to like get this yeah. shoulder back. I tore the trap up here, um, mm -hmm. surfing, a year, okay. like 25 years ago, I, I tore my trap up here. Um, and so this this always sits like this. And then when I look okay. in the mirror, I'm always like, like, oh, look at this. And you're always trying to see like, fine. Now this one sits way back. So I have a natural bias to constantly be like this. And, and you said, like, you just look at somebody's shirt and you go, oh yeah, that's, that's how someone's bias is. So maybe just explain how, cause people are gonna actually be able to see what's going on here. Yeah. What representation, what is that? What is the first thoughts that go into your mind when you see somebody with a shoulder that's protracted forward like this and, uh, you know, internally rotated and, and sitting like that? What, what are your, your instant, like, oh, this, 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 you seem to have that mind that kind of runs off into yeah. a pattern. Yeah. So this is where, again, it's helpful to look at things in, in three, you know, like a standing facing, standing facing away, standing sideways, because you can confirm what you're saying, but in general, and this goes back to our archetypes, I would, I would put you as a wide archetype, uh, right? Yeah. I've been working <laughs> on it. I mean, I've been uh, <laughs> you know, doing all my, my, um, you are a force producer at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> Come on, Jim. Please. So, so that being said, um, knowing the archetype and knowing where the center of mass is going to move next with regard to, okay, if I lose this space, I'm going to go here next. And if when I, once I lose that space, I'm going to go here next. So knowing that you're a wide and seeing that you have this kind of like wrinkled shirt on the front side, shoulders forward, that tells me that your center of mass is probably very much forward on the right hand side. And as a result, when you move forward, you take away somebody's space to internally rotate. And now if I don't have access to internal rotation, that's going to be my substitution, right? Internal rotation at the end of the day is going down. It's a down force. External rotation is going to be and more of an up force. So that said, if, if I don't have access to internal rotation, I have to figure out some way to get down into the ground. So that is your strategy. Your strategy is to 
anteriorly orient the shoulder, um, the shoulder girdle and the thorax. It's going to be to anteriorly orient that pelvis along with it. I'd be curious to see your right foot. You might even have a foot that's oriented into IR, meaning you're dropping kind of the down force in front of the foot versus being able to go to heel to toe sort of thing. Um, and so with that down pressure, the first thing that comes to mind is like sternum, right? Your pump handle, the compression on the anterior thorax is down. So rather than somebody like, I got to pull my shoulder back. What I think about is how do I get volume up into this lung? How do we start shifting volumes of air, things like that? To this open side, up. Opening up this. Yeah. Lung so that this 100%. Open up, yes. Yeah. So how do I get your sternum up? How do I open up like that anterior chamber on the right side of the thorax? Um, to give you some space to then impart some internal rotation. Then we also have to think about shifting your center of gravity back to, to give you again, some space to move into that, into that area. So it's definitely a convoluted process, but mm -hmm. knowing your archetype and where you are in space, and then also understanding the compensatory strategy, which is coming down and in to substitute for internal rotation. It tells me I have to give you another way or, you know, a better way um, to actually drive some internal rotation to the system, because that's what you're going to keep using since you don't have it. Okay. So th this is where it got really crazy for, for me watching your presentation. I was like, okay, that's great. So we can look at somebody's posture and say, you have X, Y, and Z. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you go, okay, well, obviously whatever it is, if you use the same example, whatever it is that created this, in, uh, internal rotation of the shoulder and, and protraction of the shoulder blade, any, anything that created that was it's, I know that I've had this for my entire life. Like it's happened over a long period of time. So then my first thing and my, my athletes said the same thing. Well, Jay, that's great. Now, how, but how long is it going to take? You know, because it's like it took a whole lifetime to get to this point. How long is it going to take to make some of these correctives? Um, and your answer, which blew me away, was, well, for certain ones, we should start to see at least a benefit. Yeah. Right away. We, when we do some of these correctives, we should be able to see a benefit. And then if we know that that benefit occurs, then we stay with those correctives and all of a sudden we should see change. Um, so when we talked about that, you showed a visual in this again, light bulbs. We had an athlete that looked, it was a, I think you described them as a, a wide, but like almost like a squished, like they, if I was to show a side view from the chest to the back, this person, it looked like they were like between two paint paintings. Yeah, he, he was actually a narrow, he was a narrow, narrow. pitcher, six, nine. And to your point, yes, was very compressed anterior to posterior. So yes. That's what, yeah. Your posterior chest to back was, was kind of squished. And I was like, okay, well, that's just what they've got. And then uh, a natural thing for the strength team to say would be, oh, well, let's just put a big chest and a big back on them. Like, let's try and, like, they got space. But that wouldn't yeah. change the rib cage if you did that. And that's the problem. It's not the meat on the outside of the rib cage. It's actually the shape of the rib cage. And we'll yeah. talk about the mirroring in a minute, but, but basically they were squished. And then I was like, okay, well, that's, that's just the way it is. And you're like, no, that's not just the way it is. And you showed the correctives and then you showed what, six months later or something like that. All of a sudden this person was yeah. like, a douche. and all of a sudden they had a chest and a back without any real strength training. You actually changed the shape of the rib cage. If I had hair, I'd pull it out right now. I, I, like what, how do you change the rib cage? This is something, yeah. this, some, this person was like genetically built this way and I that's what my thoughts were yeah so I think this is this is where again understanding the archetypes and what their biases will be is is very important not only from the rehab side but obviously from a performance and from a skill side too which is we had this really tall narrow pitcher um six nine and the the tall narrow arch archetypes are biased towards lots of rotation right they're biased towards velocity that's they're biased toward external rotation that's what we good at and they looked at this player and his velo, you know, was sitting 87, 88, and they really wanted to get him into the low nineties. And so I think by default, we often look at somebody who's this kind of narrow person and say, oh, well, they just need to get stronger. Right. And, and that's easy to say, and that's easy to like, just, but what does that actually mean? And so unfortunately, as this player was going through the system, the more strength training that was applied to this specific arch archetype, 
which is biased towards more rotational things. So sticking him in like a, a trap bar deadlift, sticking him in a bilateral squat, a lot of bilateral activities, granted by, you know, great for force production was actually going clear in the opposite direction, which was stealing from this guy's rotational capabilities by kind of compressing down to the system. And I think that's one thing we don't appreciate is muscle at the end of the day is compressive, right? And we have a lot of great muscles that compress us on the front and the back side that are large, but we don't have a ton of muscles that squeeze us side to side. And so as a result, this front to back compression, right? Look at any bodybuilding show that you go to, they all look like Doritos. And that's because of the compression from front to back. And why that's a problem in the specific narrow archetype is now you're taking away what makes this pitcher amazing at what he does, which is rotation. And so the more, the flatter I make this structure, let's go back to physics, right? Like an oval is not going to roll near as well as something that's a bit rounder. So that was the approach with the athlete was, you know what, let's actually pull him off of this slow grinding bilateral activities that is actually creating a lot of compression through his structure. And let's actually pull back to more velocity-based exercises, more single split stance activities that allow more rotation to happen in the system. And just by pulling off of those things, and certainly by giving him correctives that, that push airflow into certain pockets of the rib cage, we created more expansion through the system and literally expanded him from anterior to posterior, which gave him back a lot of those rotational capabilities, relative motion between segments, and we took his, his velo from 87 to 88, all the way up to 94, 95. Which so. is insane. I mean, that's the difference between like, uh, you know, going up and down from the minors to the majors to yeah. all of a sudden being an all-star. Right? This is yeah. huge. Um, and that's where the, the big moments happen for athletes is when you can make these massive changes to structures that traditionally we think are not movable because- yeah. We, we've always been given the the uh, skeleton as this rigid model, um, yeah. and you you describe really well in your in your lecture how the rib cage and even the pelvis the the movement that happens in the pelvis. Um, a lot of people think of the pelvis as this rigid thing, but in actuality, it's a, there's joints there, and the joints are moving. The SI joint moves, and uh, well, and beyond that, like the skeleton in and of itself is 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 springy. We don't think of, as bone as something that can deform, but it can, right? Um, and, and to your point, when you ask about, well, how long do these changes take? Well, if I have somebody that's younger with quote unquote a spine that's more wet and more malleable, it's a lot easier to make those changes than in someone, let's say that's 70 years old where the spine is quote unquote drier, the bones are drier and you don't have as much ability to kind of shape and mold those things. But, but bones, not only yes, do they move between segments, but the, the structure in and of itself is compressible, is malleable. They do, you can bend bone at the end of the day. So that's the other interesting piece to understand is we, we think of it as an immovable um, structure when in fact it is, is part of the connective tissue. And you can make those changes to breath, like using breath, which is crazy right. because you think of breath as such like a, um, a, I don't know, a passive thing. Yeah. There's not a lot of tension involved. Like you take a deep breath, like you can feel your lungs expand. You go, okay, there's pressure there, but enough to make change. Um, and then my, my question to you would be like, let's say we, we do some of these compressive things. Like you, you've done a wonderful job with one of my clients of like laying on their side where like this rib is compressed over here. Uh, and then they're reaching across to take away their breath from this part. So now they, the only way they could breathe is into their back, let's say. Um, you do that, uh, I don't know, two minutes a day. The rest of the day you're breathing normally, which is like way more than what you did for those two minutes that you did this corrective. Um, how do these, maybe these lifestyle or just like daily routine uh, compensatory movements um, get changed when you, when the corrective is, is such a small part of their life? So, so the important part is understanding um, what is the corrective trying to do from a shape standpoint? So I think, you know, let's go back to your shoulder. If I'm trying to get air into a manubrium or into a sternum in this upper area, if I take your hand and I put it behind your head and, oh. I, and I ask you to slightly pull the elbow back, 
that's going to take the, the scapula and it's going to compress it on the backside of the rib cage, right? So that compression from the musculature now kind of closes off that back space, which now when you go to take an inhale, and if, of course, if I put you on your side and if I prop maybe something under that left side too, now I'm forcing a ton of air into this one pocket. And as a result, rather than this orientation forward into like a substitution for fake internal rotation by giving you an actual true external rotation of this of the thorax on this right side now i've just changed the shape and i've given you access to that shape now that you have that i'm going to build it into a certain exercise now, how do I achieve that external rotation that maybe that early representation of the thorax? What exercise can I then do to have you use that new shape? Right. And then as I build that, I'm teaching you how to achieve this new shape so that you don't have to go back to the substitution of what you used in the first place. Right. And if I give you a new strategy, now you start to use that and you don't have to go back to the old position that you were in. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of building. And obviously, as you know, kind of layering and, and bridging the gap from something so rudimentary and simple, but I have to get you to get the shape first before I can then train it to that upper level, which then that's when it sticks. And that's when we see those things change. Okay. So then you also brought up this, um, cause I want to give, make sure that everybody gets the whole picture. You brought up the fact that the rib cage and the pelvis are mirrors of each other. So if, if I present with this on my thorax, then I'm probably going to have a similar concept going on with my, my pelvic position and my foot, how my, my leg connects to my pelvis. I am also going to be in this representation. Yes. Yes. So I think, again, we, we think of everything as these separate entities. Um, when, when really like we've got three spheres between the cranium, the thorax and the pelvis, right? When nature finds something that works, it repeats itself. Uh, and so with that, the, the thorax and the pelvis, like we talked about in gait, right? They're doing the same thing. It's just at a different rate, right? Mm -hmm. And if one side can't achieve a certain position, what well, stands to reason that 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 side has to create some sort of substitution. Now, certainly the thorax may have a more pronounced um, orientation to it, but it doesn't mean that the pelvis does it. It might just me, me, be more pronounced in that certain area. But that's where I look at one area and then I say, okay, I'm gonna confirm that. What do I see in the pelvis that's telling me there's an anterior orientation here? What do I also see in the foot that's also gonna clue me in on that? And so when all those things align, which they, typically do, unless there's maybe some sort of surgery that changed anatomy. Um, it's very helpful because when you see, start to see a change in one area, you should start to see a change in the other. And if you don't get that, that means that you didn't quite get quote unquote, the wave of, of change in that whole side that you needed. Okay. So th this just, uh, you know, another moment comes into mind. Um, and I just want to do this as an example for the audience is uh, when I played football back in college, broke a lot of records. It's not a big deal. Uh, none of them on the actual field, but um, so I had been hit in the ribs with a helmet. I was a running back, broke a lot of records again. It was yeah. So um, I got hit in the helmet or the, he the helmet hits me in the rib cage. Right. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So that hurt. Uh, but then it's like black and blue. Like I'm talking like, like from the whole thing. And I was just like, oh, toughen up, get back in the game. And, and so i worked my way through it. Then I go and get, I'm having trouble with my left hip, my left pelvis, the SI joint issues. Yeah. I'm having some lower back issues. And, um, this has plagued me for years and years and years. So then, uh, my doctor goes, well, let's just get an x-ray of it. And he takes an x-ray of my pelvis and my left hip to see what's going on. And he, in the x-ray, they caught the bottom of my rib cage, right? So he says, yeah. well, you broke your ribs. I go, no, no, I don't. I've never brought, broken any bones, I don't think. He's like, no, you definitely broke your ribs. Your rib went like this and it broke and it fused back. So it was on, oh. the, like, it was bad, obviously. And I go, oh yeah, sure. this bump here, I get this bump. And, <laughs> and he's like, those are not muscles, those are ribs. And I'm like, no, it's my stratus <laughs> entry. He goes, no, those are not, those are not muscles. Those are just, that's your ribs. And I go, no, it's a muscle. Anyways, he, <laughs> and so he, he, my doctor is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so anyways, my point being is, is that this then diaphragm connected yeah. to that scar tissue 
And I had one of those guys, you know, those French guys that go, oh, let me put my hands underneath and rub <laughs> inside your, your oh. I'm going to touch, I'm going to touch your uh, cranium through your rib cage. <laughs> and he went in there and he's like, your, your diaphragm is like basically attached to yeah. your rib cage. Right. So when he released it, all of a sudden I start getting these, anyways, long story short. But my point is, if yeah. this can't move because of like, it's been broken and then it has scar tissue and stuff. And if there's a mirror, does that yeah. also uh, now force that pelvis to not want to move? Is, is can it happen yeah. through injury? Is my is my question? Hundred percent, right? Like hundred percent. If you if you block movement from happening, right? I, I limit motion at a rib cage. Again, this was a huge light bulb moment for me was to think about as as we walk, as we hit, as we run. There's literally a wave that propagates, right? Whether it's an internal rotation wave, external rotation wave, that wave propagates all the way from the foot up to the head and back down again, right? And so think of it that way. If I can't propagate a wave because there's something blocking the wave from continuing through, that's clearly going to change how that side and and the other side really interact, right? So if you have this rib cage that again, can't achieve a certain shape, and maybe that shape is you can't achieve the early position or the middle position or the late position, whatever it might've been because of the protecting mechanism of the musculature, right? If you can't achieve that shape, well, now you have to create a compensatory strategy around that side. And it's not just gonna be the rib cage that has to compensate, right? It's gonna be literally everything on that side to try and help you be able to propel across the floor. So it's not, it's not like this crazy thought that an injury like that can certainly create things up and down the chain. You see it all the time. I think what we don't appreciate is how those things are connected, probably because it's hard to, you know, how does something at a shoulder stem from a toe sort of a thing. But again, if you understand the shapes and you understand like this has to go through an internal rotation wave from the foot all the way up. And if that doesn't happen and there's that wave can't propagate, there's gotta be some compensation from another area, which may have driven the shoulder issue from the toe or may have driven your hip issue from the ribs. Okay. So what I think is going to happen now is we're going to have uh, a lot of our audience going either selfishly, man, nah, it's not selfish. Come on, people don't it, it you, everybody wants to optimize themselves. I mean, there's people who, you know, wake up in the morning, have grass fed butter and the coffee over there. There's other people who uh, apparently as soon as they wake up in the morning, they pull their feet over their head and, and shine light on their <laughs> tongue. Uh, I don't know. There's, I mean, there's people that do crazy things in the morning to optimize performance. Well, they're going to hear this and they're going to go, oh, my shoulder does that. And my neck always, I can turn to the right, but I can't turn to the left. Like they're going to start freaking out. Right. So there's only one of you. But there's many people who uh, like are, are avenues that people could go down to maybe see some some uh, some results in this fashion. Because I, what I hate doing is present something to people and go, yeah, that's great, but you'll never fix it, right? Yeah. yeah. So so where can people go? Let's say they want to learn more because they want to help people. They're they're a therapist that wants to learn more about this kind of stuff, or somebody who goes, I've got an athlete, I need to get them to see someone like yourself. Uh, where would you send these people and where can you get more information on, on this type of, uh, uh, movement analysis? That's a great, that's a great question. You know, I, like I said, um, Bill Hartman, huge, huge mentor of mine puts out a lot of great information. Um, he does an excellent, um, what he calls a coffee and coaches call every Thursday mornings at 6 AM Eastern time. And that's actually where I started. I started to kind of Google some of his work and it led me in different directions. Um, but ultimately I, you know, I sat through these calls and it's coaches just like ourselves that are asking great questions, diving more into this sort of kind of line of thinking. Um, and then through that, you start to see people like myself who apply his technique. And I, I certainly put things on Instagram and on Twitter just to make people think, to say like, Hey, these things are possible. See this change. Um, so certainly like, you know, follow me on, on Instagram, uh, Dr. J. Yeah, of course. Um, and then, uh, so where, is, where, like, give them oh, your, where? yeah, like yeah. Your Instagram. Yeah, it's at Dr. J Reiner. So D R J R E I N E R, um, Twitter, I guess that's now X called X. Uh, I'm on the same thing there. Um, so I'll certainly put a lot of before and after changes. I love showing the visual um, of what I'm looking at so that people can follow along. Um, but I think, you know, those those would be some starting points. And, you know, certainly, like I said, Bill's got a lot of good, good stuff out there that I would recommend. 
Cool. All right. Well, um, I know that people are going to dive right in there and I'm going to put links to all your, uh, your information uh, if people want to reach out. And, and people do. The, the, the great thing about this audience is that they do uh, get excited about this and they do want to get involved and they want to interact. So Instagram would be the best place for them to actually message you and, and maybe uh, ask a few questions. Would that be the best place to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Very cool. Um, so then, you know, if you got my light bulbs going as far as like, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out and, and do the math so I can help my clients. Uh, where's your brain going? Cause now you got my brain going here. I'm, I'm sure I'll go down this rabbit hole for, for at least a couple of years of just trying to, yeah. I can see things in people that I never saw before. I'm going to be looking yeah. at things a little differently. And then hopefully at some point I'm going to go, Oh, I finally get it. Where's your brain going? Because this, obviously this rabbit hole started, you know, years past where you yeah. went through, through, through all these learning opportunities. Where, yeah. where are you going in the future with this? So th there's two spaces right now where I think I'm, I'm really trying to gain more knowledge. One is like, one, can we identify this stuff, which is kind of what I've been showing you. Uh, the hard part is changing it. And I think the correctives for me are, are make sense. But then when you start to get into the gym and you start to say, how do I perform this sort of a chop that shifts the center of mass to the heel versus the toe? How do I create an early representation or a middle representation through the traditional exercises that we've, we've learned? I just haven't looked at it through that lens. And so when you're trying to build a program, let's say like, you know, I think an easy example is using a back squat versus a front squat, you know, back squat, the representation is more toward a late position in the thorax and the pelvis versus a front squat would be more of an early representation. So it's like, when you understand what shape do I need to make? How do you build a program getting biasing those certain shapes through exercises that we already know and love, but now looking at them through a different light. So that's one area where I'm trying to get better at. The second area would be um, actually understanding uh, the golf world has used, um, obviously what's happening to the ball for a long time. But if you look at baseball, they're really looking at spin access and spin efficiency and those sorts of things. So what I'm looking at is I want to know as the pitcher releases a ball or in your case, right, what happens to the, the face of the club, which is going to then affect the ball. How do you trace that back to the movement of the hand, the wrist, the form, et cetera? So if I'm making changes proximately, how does that now change the arm position, which changes the ball flight? So I can now look at a pitcher and say like, well, he's cutting the ball and it's because he can't do this. So it's fun to be able to reverse engineer looking at what the movement of the ball is doing um, back to the, what the player is doing. Yeah. That's so cool. And yeah, I mean, that's, it's like our lives are not long enough to figure all this stuff out it seems and that's where collaboration and uh uh vulnerability in your oh, yeah. question i think it, for coaches listen to me folks uh be vulnerable uh it's okay to not know i've been doing this yes. for 25 years and i i feel like an idiot talking to jen it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to not know the key is to find people that have knowledge in an area that maybe you don't and you don't have to know it all, but you, it, if it's in, if it's intriguing you and it's making you ask questions, then dive deeper into that rabbit hole and and uh, and, and get to learn this stuff. Um, I I don't feel like I'll ever be a, an expert in this, but I definitely am now seeing people uh, differently, which means that there has been change. So, yeah. like you can change the archetype of a rib cage, you can also change the archetype of your mind. Oh boy. Oh, I mean, cheesy but good, Jay. Cheesy but good. Yes. <laughs> that's what that's my wife. That's how my wife describes me. He's cheesy but good. He's cheesy but good. Um, so uh I love these calls. I'm glad that people got to uh hear what we talk about when we talk with about our players um in a very generalized way uh so i think this is going to open up a lot of eyes and, and i'm excited for that uh it's so great to have you on the perform better circuit um i think that uh, your message and the, your the way you present it is beautiful you can tell that you're excited about it you're enthusiastic about the information you're sharing with people which is awesome uh so for all those reasons i think like this is just your rocket ship moving forward and uh i'm i'm, I'm happy to be at least hanging on by a rope in the, uh, in the afterburners, uh, trying to keep up. Um, so you got a beautiful family, you got your husband's okay. Uh, okay. And 
yeah, just keep being you, girl. It's uh, you're, you're kicking ass, and I, I can't wait to see how you how you progress over the next few years. It's it's going to be unbelievable. Thanks so much, and thanks for, for for what you do for the industry as well, and and certainly keeping this light and fun. Like I love fun. You this, tried. This is absolutely fun. This was great. What else are we going to do? Right? Let's 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 make it more serious, shall we? Yes. <laughs> So Jen, thank you so much for coming on the Coach Glass podcast. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And uh, I think you have to come on like three more times to beat your husband. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't know what else we can do. So uh, I'm in for many hour. this is good. Yeah, it's a fun time, right? It's good times. So uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And uh, until next time, cheers, everybody. Welcome to the next level.